We are now joined by number seven ranked UFC lightweight contender, Paul Felder. Paul, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank we'll you. Take, we'll take our first question from Mike Bond with USA Today. Your line is open. Hey, Paul. Uh, we're about 21 hours from the way in. How are you feeling? <clears throat> I feel good. Um, I did a little cut uh, before all this, so I'm obviously a little bit um, dragging right now. I'm sorry for that, but... Uh, I just want to really make sure that I'm, I'm going to be on weight tomorrow morning. So I just wanted to get a head start and whew, I can't believe how well that, that little first cut went. And then I, I'll go sleep after this and then we'll do the rest of it uh, later tonight. But man, it, it's, it was flowing out of me. So it's, we're in a very, very good spot right now. So um, if I don't look great, it's because uh, I'm cutting weight. So I apologize. Fair enough. And how much, I mean, if you weren't doing this, you know, training for the triathlon and everything, this wouldn't have been a possible scenario for you, right? Not even, you know, you know how it is. You've seen me uh, on the road, not even remotely a possibility. I would have been in the 190s, you know, I would have been uh, maybe 200 pounds, who knows? Uh, it depends on how many beers I was drinking. But that wasn't the case. I was doing massive amounts of cardio. I mean, we're talking 10 mile run some days and uh, 50 mile bike rides and uh, you know 1.5 mile swims in the morning with different snorkels and pool boys and fins i mean i was doing full-blown like really training for this thing and still hitting pads and doing some mma as well so i had the weight was in the 70s just walking around where normally it's in the high 80s to 90s so it's kind of like a a weird coincidence, right? That I did this thing. I kind of put MMA out of my mind. And because of that, it kind of forced itself back into my life, which is kind of awesome because I didn't want MMA to be done in my life, but I started getting a little bitter towards the division and the way everything was going. And I didn't see that road anymore, you know? And I told you guys from the beginning, if I don't see that path towards the top, then why am I doing it? Why am I getting hit in the head? Why am I coming home? you know, beat up to my family if if I'm not going to be the best. I, I'm not fighting just to make money. I'm fighting for opportunities that will set me up for the future and for bigger things. And then this presents itself. And I know there's a lot of people out there like, oh, well, you don't have anything to lose. Yeah, you do. You have all this to lose. It's like I'm stepping in on five days notice to fight an absolute legend in RDA. If I lose and he takes my ranking, okay, then I know that maybe I'm not meant to be fighting for the title anyway, right? So that path is still there. And with a win how can you argue to not give me a fight that I really want with one of these top guys and one of these exciting matchups at 155 pounds? So for me, it's just, it made sense. Yeah. And you address you know, the physical side of it there. What about the mental side? You were supposed to be doing commentary for this card. I imagine you were looking into RDA and kind of studying him from the broadcast side of it. But when you slip, you know, switched over to the opponent, did that make that easier for you? Cause you already kind of knew the guy. I mean, obviously you've seen him around forever. You know, the fighter he is, but and yeah. actually studying him. Yeah. And this fight had been kind of mentioned uh, months ago and at the time, it was right after the hooker fight, and I was like, nah, not right now. It doesn't make sense to me right now. You know, I was still really gunning and thinking that I was going to get one of these guys much higher ranked. So I didn't want to take a fight with RDA, even though I have tons of respect for him, uh, because I, I thought I could get a top five guy. Um, and ultimately, that didn't work out. And then the Makashev thing happened, and here we are. So it's not like I didn't ever want to fight this guy. I have respect for him. I think he's, uh, you know, uh, one of the best to, to ever be in the lightweight division but so yeah that that really doing research on him didn't really play a part because i called his kevin lee fight as well so it's i've done research on him i've studied him i've seen him fight live many times so yeah that wasn't uh that wasn't a big factor well and last thing because i'm sure other people want to jump in here um is it kind of hard to ask you anything about what this means for the future and, you know, what win loss, all that kind of stuff, just cause it's really going to depend on the performance. I know you mentioned it a little bit like, yeah, I should get one of those big fights if I win here, but is it just kind of too hard to tell what the fallout of this is going to be? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. Right. Um, I think with a win, obviously it's going to be, could be awesome to just be like, ah, throw the gloves down and be like, I'm done five days. What? And then walk away. But, uh, 
there's the other part of me that knows that when that hand gets raised, it's going to be like, ooh, I want to do that again. You know, I want, I want bigger fights. I want to camp for this one. But I feel like I've also learned a little bit about myself and I feel like I've matured in this time off because I can't go and uh, get fat and not be training as hard in between these fights and expect to get to the top. Because if you can't take opportunities like this, sometimes you're going to keep getting skipped by. So I think learning how to have a lifestyle for myself that is sustainable. Um, so that I can keep fighting and stay healthy throughout throughout the year, even though I'm not in camp, you know. So doing all the running and the training and swimming and all that kind of stuff and racing every now and then, I think will really keep me uh, tuned up and keyed up along with all the MMA training, obviously. But I think doing a little less of the contact in the off season, and then when you book a fight, then obviously I'll ramp that kind of stuff up. So if I can do that and I can feel healthy and my body feels good and obviously, you know, I don't take too much damage, and I, I see a win making me want to keep going now. Awesome. Well, either way, you're a legend for this one. Thanks for the time, Paul. Thank you, man. We'll go next to Augusto Niaz Gay with Somos MMA. Your line is open. Hey, Paul, how are you? Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay. Paul, which is your approach to this fight with five days notice and no training camp? I mean, on what do you focus on the, the little amount of preparation that you have for an opponent like RDA? Um, cutting weight, primarily making sure that I'm um, going to make the weight was number one. And then we all sat down and we watched, you know, we just went through a few key fights in his career. And we picked out a couple things that we think line up really well with my style. And um, obviously, you can't go too crazy. You've only got five days. If I go and try to get myself in fight shape, I'm already in shape, you know? So I just kind of did a couple really hard blowouts early in the week to see where my lungs are for five rounds. And we did five, six rounds with a minute rest, and I was dropping my heart rate in between each one. I was still cracking hard. I did some grappling with Dan Ige over at Extreme Couture last night. Drilled, drilled, drilled. Just did some get-ups, some submission stuff. We did some wrestling, just, you know, moving around in the octagon over there at uh, Extreme with, with him, Eric Nixick, and just moving around and kind of just getting that feel, you know, standing in the corner when the 10-second bell claps, just getting our minds right for the fight. Because, you know, I think we forget that, uh, you know, we've all, the guys that are at this level, we've been doing this for a long time. You don't forget how to fight after a couple months, you know. Uh, and I also call fights every week. I'm at that octagon site. I'm in this environment nonstop. So this is home for me. I just now have to switch hats and, uh, and, and get nasty and get my mind into that place where I'm going to go beat somebody's ass on Saturday night. Yeah. And, and, and talking about that, where do you think are going to be the keys for your victory Saturday? I think just giving him the Philly phone booth, as Duke would say, and letting him know that you come anywhere near me, you're getting hit with something hard. Um, you want to take me down, you're getting smashed with my hip, and then if I get back up, I'm going to knee you in the face. You know, I just got to let them know there's going to be violence every step of the way. Uh, and I think he fights a little bit like that. So I think, uh, I think the fans are in for a good one. I think that this fight, the way it switched up, I mean, even though Makashev is an absolute beast, it's a different fight, right? I think we're going to see a lot of grappling in that fight with him and Makashev, where it's now, if I can keep it on the feet and my defense on, you know, on the takedowns holds up, I, th I think we're going to see quite a good battle on the feet between somebody that's got really good boxing from the southpaw stands and more of a Muay Thai stylist than myself who likes to clash in a little bit and use the clinch. Uh, he's good in the clinch, too. This is the first time in a very long time I fought somebody shorter than me. Kind of excited about that. <laughs> um, you know, I haven't fought a sh shorter, stocky guy in a while. They've all been 5'11", 6 foot, 6'1". James Vick was 6'3". So uh, it's, it's, a, it's nice to get back down and face these kind of grappling-heavy, um, stockier guys. I, I'm, I'm curious to see how it plays out. Yeah, I understand you. And, Paul, people on social media have been talking, and, and part of my French, about your balls for taking this fight. And yeah. there is no doubt that this was a BMF move. So taking that into consideration, would you like a shot for that BMF title yeah. in, in the future or, or maybe for a BMF belt in, uh, at 155? 
Yeah, well, man, why not, right? I mean, if they want to get crazy with that stuff and uh, sell some shows, if I can get some more fans on my side after this one, I would love something like that, man. Like, those are the kind of fights that if I'm not going to, you know, you don't want to give me one of these top five guys right now, keep giving me stuff that's a little wacky, a little crazy, it's exciting, gets the fans going nuts, gets me going nuts. You know, that's, that's what I want. I want to, when I wake up, I want to be scared about the fight. I want to be excited about the fight, and I want to be intrigued about it. And if all those things line up, then, yeah, something like that would be so much fun. Awesome. Paul, you are not only an experienced fighter of the company, but also one of the of, the, of, of ESPN. And considering that today is the 27th anniversary of the UFC 1, so I, I want to, like, I, I would like to, to know which UFC events are on your top three list for the greatest events, or, or those that you remember the most. Hmm. Um, I mean, I would say some of the craziest ones I, I've been a part of, uh, that one, when I called the, I think the 25th anniversary in Denver, that was a lot of fun. And that was the uh, year phew, Korean zombie yeah. fight. That was absolutely nuts. Um, I've called some John Jones fights over the years, man. I've gotten the call, um, DC's fights, Conor McGregor versus Cowboy was a crazy one to have that, to see, you know, Connor make his walk in front of those crazy crowds. That was definitely something, even though he's in the division and we're, you know, potentially, uh, you know, could face off with each other someday. It still was, you know, it was so much fun to be a, to be a part of that and to, to have him even say F you to me, I believe from cage side there. So that one, that one stands out. Awesome. Well, my last one, a few months ago, when your broadcast partner, John Annie grew his mustache, People on Twitter call it the, the Annex stash. So do you think it's time for the Felder stash? Listen, John Annick is a legend, and I love that mustache. I'm so glad that he's been rocking it because he used to he used to rock it at home, and then when we'd see him on fight week and he'd shave it off for um for the fights. And we were all telling him, I was like, man, you gotta keep that thing. I like the mustache. And uh, yeah, for this month, it's uh, it's November. You know, people know about Movember, uh, Men's Health Awareness, and uh, it's also Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Month. I've lost a lot of people to pancreatic cancer, and uh, including my father, who uh, who lost his life to that horrible cancer. And he used to rock a mustache when I was a little kid. I have a lot of really awesome pictures of me and him when I was a child with him with a mustache. So. Uh, on Halloween, I just, uh, for fun, and, you know, we were going to, to November the, the next day, so I shaved off the beard and rocked the stash, and then I obviously got the call for the fight, and I wasn't going to wasn't gonna back out just because I got a fight to shave off the mustache, so here we are. Awesome. Paul, thank you very much, and good luck on Saturday. Thank you. We'll go next to Louise Green with MMA Crazy. Your line is open. Hi, uh, Paul. Um you mentioned earlier there that you was uh, bitter towards the division, uh, and I'm, you know, curious to to know, you know, obviously with Khabib gone now, do you feel differently about the division and and continuing to compete? Yeah, well, I think um, I think that does open up the doors for a lot of guys. Um, it gets things moving at least, right? If we can start getting a new champion and guys fighting for that belt, then there's gotta be guys fighting to be the next contender and guys fighting to be in, in line for that. So it, it, it gets things moving. That's always kind of been the problem with the 155 pound division and some other divisions too, right? Where you've got a dominant champion or guys going back and forth because there's close fights or guys are such high level and, and, and big names and then they don't fight and then they fight. So it gets challenging and I'm not, I'm not accusing anybody of anything, but the, the division was definitely in a bit of a, a, a stagnant position. Um, and if Khabib stays, that's fine too. And let's get him some fights. But if he does retire, I think that opens the door for, for guys like myself, for the Dustin Poirier's, for Connor, for Gaethje to even get another big fight. But I think since he lost, you know, that means he's got to fight somebody a little bit lower that gives me an opportunity to fight somebody a little higher. So yeah, I do see um, a much brighter future at 155 pounds if, if Khabib uh, is out. Um, but again, I'm not wishing him to retire. It's, it's up to him. Yeah, and you, and you mentioned as well there about when Connor said F you 
uh, to you when you were cage side and that's the moment that stood out for you. I know obviously he's, you know, you're thinking about this Saturday and, and you're not thinking about him at the moment, but um, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you noticed, I think it was on Tuesday he tweeted um, something uh, with your name. He mentioned two German names and then your surname afterwards. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, I don't know if he was implying if he, if that you're he's talking about my name, which mm -hmm. is more German then let's talk about his Scottish name and how he's Scottish then. So shut, shut the fuck up. That's <laughs> and, and, that. Okay. <laughs> go, go blow uh, some lines and shut the fuck up. And, and again, I'm curious, obviously you're on your thoughts of his return and, and how you think his uh, rematch goes down with Poirier. Man, I think Poirier is a, a much different beast uh, than than obviously they were when they fought at 145 pounds. But uh, I mean, listen, you can say what you want about Connor, and he can talk all the trash about me that he wants. But I it, I think he's extremely skillful, and uh, if Dustin tries to stand with him, I think it's it could be another crazy war, and I think it's anybody's fight at that point if they just plan on boxing with each other. So. Um, but I think it'll be a little more competitive this time. Uh, I think Dustin can bring it and um, not get caught as early, and he doesn't have as drastic of a weight cut since it'll be at 155 pounds and not down at 145. Um, so yeah, um, uh, should be a good one for sure. And you know, with with all that said, with all that you know that history there between you two, do you see your you know you both aligning and and maybe you know meeting inside the octagon in the future near future who's that with connor with connor yeah oh god i don't i mean i don't know um i gotta i gotta win this five five day fight uh <laughs> first before i can even start talking about that kind of stuff but i mean obviously these are the fights i want right i mean if i win on saturday these are the fights that i would like to get and uh you know, and just getting my name out there, doing things like this and getting the exposure, you know, you got to do some bold things sometimes to, to, to get your name out there and to get people interested in you. I mean, the UFC doesn't want to market you if people don't care about you. So you've got to you got to step up to the plate sometimes and um, and swing for the fences. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you for your time. Thanks. Thank you. We'll go next to Damon Martin with MMA Fighting. Your line is open. Hey, Paul, uh, Hooker, you were very honest afterwards and said, you know, you weren't sure if you were going to fight again. You've been doing the commentary thing. You got other projects going on. So, you know, you weren't exactly saying, you know, I'm retired, but you weren't saying I'm gunning for another fight. And then when you come back, I think everyone's excited to see you fight again. But, you know, five days notice, five round main event, dropping out of lightweight. Like, what was it in your head that said this, this is what's going to get you back in there? Uh, because I think a lot of people have said, no way, there's no chance I'm going to take a fight like this. Yeah, and that's why I'm here, because everybody says stuff like that. And that's the reason they're not here and I'm here, you know. Um, listen, man, you don't, you don't get the things you want in life by being safe and by not taking risks. And uh, I've kind of made my career on, you know, fighting the dangerous guys, doing the crazy things, going to other countries and fighting them in their backyards. And this is just another one of the one for the storybooks of the stupid stuff that I do uh, throughout my career. And um, I don't know, it's what I've made my career off of. And uh, I, I, I've never been that guy that's had to take a fight on crazy short notice like this. I've taken a fight like on a month's notice when I fought um, Ross Pearson, me and him both took it on like four weeks notice. Both of us were coming off losses and wanted to get back in there, but that's the closest I've ever come to a to a short notice fight. And let me tell you this: this weight cut is better than that weight cut was. I had a four week camp for Ross Pearson and barely made weight for that fight. And this fight, I feel like, is uh, on a better track than 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 that one. And taking a fight like this, we've seen it a couple of times this year where a guy. And you know, kind of fill a main event slot, and we've seen a couple of three round events, which is kind of unusual. And then we saw a fight like Brendan Allen and Sean Strickland come together for this car, where both guys said, "Listen, there's no way we're going to make 185." So they're doing a catchweight. Like, did that? Did that ever? Like, did you ever discuss that with you? Said, "Hey, maybe we do a, a one catchweight or maybe do a three round fight." Like, you doing this on five days' notice is crazy enough, but 
one fifty five and five rounds. I, again, I don't know. There's there's a handful of fighters in the world that would be willing to do that. Yeah, well, I wouldn't have done the fifty five thing if I didn't think that I can make the 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 weight. I was in a. Was it, I mean, I was walking around pretty skinny recently, and um, yeah, uh, I want to make money and I want to get to some extra money and. Uh, you want to negotiate for bigger paychecks and more stuff you can't be like but um it's got to be this this and this because then they'd have been like okay we'll give you a catch weight okay we'll give you three rounds but you're not getting anything else you know what i mean like if you want to get more out of it you got to be willing to do some stuff too so i was like all right look i'll do 55 i'll do five rounds i want this and uh here we are one of the things that kind of rings true and you mentioned maybe a little frustration of the lightweight division. he said you know he's kind of getting sick of people handpicking fights and you know don't want to fight other guys unless they're ranked above them and things like that like do you feel like that like do you agree with him in terms of where we're at because the lightweight division is so good but it feels like we we maybe are missing out on some fights when certain guys are saying oh no 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 i will only fight a guy who's ranked above me or you know i will only take this fight like, do you feel that frustration? Do you, do you see that happening more and more lately? Yeah, yeah, I do. And as I get older, and if I work as a commentator. You know, I, I see the, I see everything now. You know, I know how this business works a lot more, and I know that stepping up, I know that throwing down and fighting your balls off and going hard. And not sloppy, not being a maniac out there, but if you go out there and you, 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 know, you go for it, that stands out. Fighting people that they want you to fight stands out. And putting on a show and performances are what sets you out. It's not necessarily, what's his ranking? What's this? If you go out there and you finish dudes or you look good going hard and looking good on the feet and doing things like that, that's what will, will get you kind of what you want. That's what's going to get you the bonuses. That's what's going to renegotiate your contracts better. Um, not sitting on the sidelines and begging for the number five guy and the number four guy. Um, and so, you know, I had to kind of put my mouth, my mouth, you know. What am I trying to say, Brian? I had to put my, my money where my mouth is, sorry. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I've been kind of saying that, right? And here I am. So um, I'm going to fight a guy who's not ranked at 155, but he's a former champion. Uh, and it's a main event, so it's like, I don't think that really matters here. And last thing for the broadcast this weekend, if everything goes well on Saturday night and you win the main event, do you do your own post-fight interview? Man, wouldn't that be fun? Wouldn't that be fun? Because <laughs> uh, who's this supposed to be? It'll probably be Mike, right? It'll probably be Mike. I'll be like, Mike, hold on. I got this. I got this. Uh, no, I won't. But I was supposed to work contender series next week. But luckily, they they took me off of that, so I will get to go home and rest, uh, rest and drink beer. There's already some uh, some mad elves in the fridge that Christine got me for me at home, so I'm gonna go pound them down and order me an imperial pizza back uh, back in Delco and and live my life. Paul, thank you. We will take our final questions from Pre uh, Patrick Prokolski with TVP Sport. Your line is open. Hello, oh, Paul. Can you hear me? I got you. Okay. Uh, you are coming back from a few months layoff, and uh, I was thinking about uh, what was going through your head uh, through this time about whether you should compete or, or not, and did you have uh, any offers to fight uh, at this time? Um, yes. I mean, over the months, we've... we've been uh, thrown some ideas for fights and RDA was actually one month ago. And at the time I was still really trying to get uh, somebody a little higher ranked and wanted to wait around and, and see what was going to happen. And then I got just kind of, you know, over it for a little bit, you know, you get burnt out in the sport, man. You really do. You, you do this long enough. You've got as many fights as I do. And I don't even have as many fights as some of the guys on the roster, but you get 20 some fights I've had most of my career in the UFC. All my losses are in the UFC. I, I was undefeated when I got signed. Um, so, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I commentate as well. I'm, I'm always here. I'm always at the octagon. I'm always MMA, MMA, MMA. So 
I feel like mentally I just needed to take a little, a couple months break and, and get interested in something else and, and revive my mind a little bit, you know, and, and get that passion back. Because if you just do the same thing every day, every day, every day, it gets old, right? You've got to just splice it with some other hobby. And I did that. And that really kind of refreshed my mind and made me start missing MMA. And then when I started training it again and and even when I got this offer and I went and started working out, I was like, man, I, I, I miss this. I miss this nervous feeling. I miss this energy. And uh, so that that was kind of what woke me up for this was uh, that fire getting relit. So I think those few months off really helped. OK, and uh, will this fight will this fight really show uh, your form right now? Or you think that even if you lose, uh, it's not a problem because you didn't have a camp and uh, it's not a big deal. I mean, listen, it's not it's not 100 percent ideal, but I'm looking at the positives, right? Because this close to a fight, I can't sit and, and nag myself about what I didn't have. I can think about, well, what do you have coming into this fight? And what I do have is I, I was in really good shape and I was training really hard. Uh, I was training really hard. I had a triathlon race that I'm still scheduled for in March. Um, I, I had hired a, a coach for it and everything. Um, my man, David, the, the, my, my guy, Lionel Sanders, who's a pro triathlete. These guys were, were setting out whole game plans, training peaks. I mean, I had a, a websites, apps. I'm on Zwift racing on there, doing all this kind of stuff. So, I mean, I'm biking, you know, 25 to 50 miles a day. I'm swimming over a mile a day. I'm doing, you know, anywhere from six to 10 mile runs two, three times a week. Um, I was eating very, very good. You know, I was able to still have my cheat meals and get a lot of calories in me without depleting myself. My body has not taken damage. I have not had any concussions since, since fighting Dan Hooker. I have not really taken any big damage. Um, so I, I feel fresh. I feel fast. I feel loose. Um, so I feel like it's kind of, you know, uh, let's go for it and see what happens kind of thing, because if I go, if it goes well, then I know, OK, I can adjust some things in my training camp moving forward so that I can be a little bit healthier coming into these fights. OK, so the last two from me, uh, Charles Sonner used to say that uh, the fighter has three ways to shine. Not only a fight, but also uh, the way the walkout and the post-fight speech. And I know the circumstances are crazy for you, but do you have any name in your mind for a callout if you win? I've got a, I've got a few, yeah. But um, we will uh, we will wait and see if I get that W on Saturday, and then we'll be uh, we'll be hearing them. Okay, and the last one, uh, the lightweight division is. Uh, kind of in between a few things right now right it's a little bit mess we know we don't know if habib is truly uh, out and uh, if he if he does um, what would you do to uh, to to get a new champ who do you think should should get the chance or maybe uh, maybe maybe make something like a old fashioned tournament something like that yeah, you know, I, I think that tournament idea is really cool, honestly, because that gets all of us busy and active right away. And it kind of forces everybody to kind of be like, all right, there's no hand picking this. You know, we set it up and there's a bracket and you fight and we get there. And then once we get there and there's a champion, then that 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 can be gone. Right. But when you've had a champion like Khabib and then he's gone, you've got all these contenders who are all kind of bouncing around wins and losses with each other. And there's some guys that are really trying to squeeze into that mix. Um, Oliveira, Hooker, myself, uh, Michael Ch Chandler in the mix now. I think it just makes sense to make this big, what, I mean, eight-man tournament or something like that and have us work our way up towards that belt. I like that idea. Okay, uh, me too. Uh, good luck to good luck on Saturday. I'm looking forward to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. You're all set. Thank you.